insulin resistance, like consuming carbohydrates so much that you're potentially making yourself resistant to the effects of insulin could really be the bigger issue at play in terms of why we feel foggy, why we feel like our cognitive function is declining. Okay? We have to look at the big picture. It's very easy to say that sugar is a problem, and I agree, sugar is definitely a problem, but what ends up happening is that it's the overconsumption over the long haul, that cumulative effect that leads to the potential issues. And the reason that I can say that with more confidence is because when you look at science and you look at data, it's much better to look at longer term, larger studies that really look at things over a period of time that are truly observational, okay, where you see what is happening to a large cohort of people. So in this particular case, there's a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care, took a look at 7,148 participants okay, that were not type 2 diabetic and they did not have signs of cognitive decline. They were not, uh, did not have dementia or anything like that. And what they did is at baseline, they gave them cognitive tests. They measured their cognitive function. They also measured their baseline insulin levels. Okay, then what happens is over the course of years, so at three years and at six years, they measured these things again. They looked at their levels of cognitive decline with cognitive function tests, and they looked at their levels of insulin. Well, they found that hyperinsulinemia was definitely correlated with cognitive decline with mild cognitive decline. Now with this, you can speculate a lot of different things. There's obviously a lot of variables here, but when you look at larger studies like this, you see, okay, well, there's definitely something going on there, okay? People that were having these like, issues with hyperinsulinemia were definitely battling some levels of cognitive decline. Now when you look at a study that was published in the journal Alzheimer's Research and Therapy, it allows you to dive a little bit deeper. Now this study demonstrated that peripheral insulin resistance was associated with decreased glucose metabolism in the hippocampal region of the brain. What does that mean? Well, the brain runs on glucose, okay? The brain doesn't run on fats. Although some people might think even with a keto diet, the brain runs on fats, that's incorrect. The brain can run on ketones partially, which are fats that are turned into ketones and then go through the blood-brain barrier. But fats themselves, fatty acids, cannot cross through the blood-brain barrier. So in a normal individual that is not following a lower carb protocol, you're dependent on the glucose. So if you become insulin resistant, think about it. That means that your cells and your brain can't use the glucose as well, which by default is gonna decrease cognitive function because you've literally just decreased your fuel. They also found in the same study that there was a decrease in gray matter volume. So the brain could potentially be atrophying. So these are very important things. Now the reason that I mention this is because I think we go through a lot of effort in, especially in the low carb community, of demonizing carbohydrates. And I understand the angle uh, of doing that because you wanna make sure that you know if you're following a low carb or a ketogenic diet, yeah, you wanna have carbohydrates as low as possible. But I think the problem that we face, especially in this country, in the United States, is much more about the insulin resistance issue from the cumulative effect of carbohydrates. So when it comes down to how you are eating and the choices that you're making, you don't have to make this giant, pivotal, like big change in your life like one day you're like consuming carbohydrates, the next day you're not consuming any carbohydrates, you can make these small little changes that happen over time. You can do pretty simple things in terms of lifestyle changes too, to kind of reduce the amount of carbohydrates or reduce the amount of sugar that you consume. Today's video is sponsored by Lakanto, and I want you to check this out. Okay, so if we look at Lakanto, this is a monk fruit erythritol blend sweetener. So it can be used like when you're baking or it can be used to make hot chocolate or anything like that. It's a very cool product. Okay, I've known the guys at Lakanto for a very long time. They've brought a lot of videos to life on this channel, so I'm very, very grateful for their, their, their help with this channel, but also just for creating a good product. Now, there are a lot of different products that are out there on the market okay, that are trying to kind of be in the same category. So Lakanto uses a really cool technology where they have an erythritol granule and then they spray coat it with monk fruit. Okay, that way you're getting like an even coating and you're not getting this sort of kind of cattywampus, half erythritol, half monk fruit, possibly sometimes 30% monk fruit, 30%, it's like, it's all over the place, right? So you're getting a really cool even granule. So like you can kind of see here, it's all the granules are the same size, makes it really easy to bake with, makes it really easy to cook with, things like that. The thing with the Splenda version, one thing I've noticed is it's got a really weird smell. I noticed this when I did a grocery haul a while back and I, and I brought it home. I was like, my wife said, like, like, that's got a really weird smell to it. The other thing is you end up with this weird kind of residue. So I don't know really what it is about it, but it doesn't really taste like sugar the way that Lakanto does. Also, you can totally see in this case, 
the granules are huge. The granules are 10 times the size of that of Lakanto. In fact, if I even do this, even this far from the camera, you can see the difference. Okay, and there's also a really artificial, like kind of white looking, I don't know what's going on there, but in terms of being able to have granules that are the same size as sugar, that's gonna end up being the best bet going with the Lakanto there. Now the other one is the sweet leaf one. Now sweet leaf, <laughs> It's better if you ask me than the Splenda one, but the thing with the sweet leaf is a very inconsistent granule sizes. So like I look at it right now, it's hard to tell it. It's like some are really small, some are really large, and it's all over the place. It just makes it really hard to bake with because you're having inconsistency. And it's not using that same technology that we're really having with the Lakanto as well. And then the last one that I don't have in front of me right now, but you've probably seen the packets of Whole Earth, and I know Costco sells the Whole Earth brand. The weird thing about the Whole Earth, I don't know if it's an inconsistency in the ingredients or what, but it is very, very uh, powerful on the erythritol taste. It has that really like heavy cooling sensation you get with erythritol. I don't have any issue with erythritol because it's a sugar alcohol that doesn't really metabolize, but when it doesn't dissolve or it has a weird taste, it ends up being different. So anyway, big thank you to Lakanto for making this video possible, and there's a special link down below if you want to save a few bucks and get your hands on some Lakanto and a wide variety of different products that they have. So big thank you and now let's get back to the science. One of the things I really want to focus on is insulin resistance and neuroinflammation. Now I want you to imagine this. You have different regions of your brain, right? And these regions of your brain communicate with one another. They send signals to one another and that's how your brain sort of works in harmony, right? And there's this old saying that a quiet brain, a relaxed brain is a fast brain. And what that implies is that when your brain doesn't have a lot of bombardment of just craziness going on, it's actually able to make decisions better. This is called network stability. Now there was a study that was published in the National Proceedings of the Academy of Sciences that was very interesting because this study in particular looked at ketones, okay? Doesn't mean you have to go keto, but I found it very interesting. It found that ketones stabilize network stability. What that means is that when there was a little less glucose and more ketones, the brain was a quieter, more organized symphony. The regions of the brain, the network stability was better. They also found that there was a destabilization that occurred when glucose was consumed in excess. So in a shorter term situation, it's like, yeah, the brain wasn't able to function as well with high amounts of glucose. Now I want you to think about it like this for just a second. Your brain is, uh, a series of networks of, let's just think of it as a bunch of whispering, okay? And in order to hear the whispering that's occurring within the brain, the brain has to be quiet and there has to be good network stability. But if all of a sudden everyone starts shouting, the messages can't get heard, okay? It's loud and obnoxious and crazy and it's unstable, okay? So that in that whispering environment, we need to keep it whispering and quiet so that the signals can get to where they're supposed to go. If it's too loud, then you can obviously see how there's a problem. Now with insulin resistance and neuroinflammation, this is part of the equation too, because neuroinflammation is just like the name implies, it's inflammation that's happening at a neurological level in the brain. When there's a lot of inflammation in the brain, those communication pathways get disrupted too. Now I'm gonna simplify this because this gets fairly complex, but there is a nuclear receptor protein that is called PPAR delta. Now, if you're a veteran of this channel, you've heard me talk about PPAR gamma, PPAR alpha, they all have to do with fat adaptation and keto and all this. PPAR delta is more so related to insulin. Now, normally in a good, healthy functioning brain, keto or not, we want a certain level of insulin to pass through this PPAR delta. Okay, when it hits that PPAR delta, it signals that the brain is functioning the way that it should, and therefore the cells function and go through their normal processes the way that they should, and everything is hunky-dory. When you have a down regulation of PPAR because there's not enough insulin to hit it because you're insulin resistant, well that's when you have an increase in neurodegeneration, an increase in neuroinflammation, and an increase in oxidative stress, oxidative damage. Okay, the oxidative damage it's, that's when you just have an abundance of free radicals, right? So let's say the cells just aren't functioning efficiently or cleanly. So they're emitting much more in the way of, let's call it exhaust. This exhaust is obviously not good for the brain. We have components of our own system inside our body, our own endogenous antioxidants, that their sole job is to go out and scavenge these things. It's obviously a very important thing. So when we have an increase of this oxidative stress, we are asking much more of our body to try to deal with and clear this stuff out. A big problem. So it seems like insulin resistance might be playing a big role with that. Because when PPAR can get acted upon normally by a normal level of insulin, then everything is the way that it should be. 
Another thing we have to remember about oxidative stress is when oxidative stress increases, we are disrupting this signal that is essentially telling our cells to survive. Okay, so when insulin resistance is high, we impair the signal that tells our cells to not go through what's called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a premature, sometimes unexpected cell death. Okay, it's where the cells just sort of self-destruct and burst. We don't want that to happen at a neuronal level. Certain areas of the body, apoptosis is okay and kind of encouraged in some categories, but at the brain level, we don't want our brain cells to just decide they just want to die and explode one day. That's not exactly what we want. Oxidative stress can definitely trigger that up because it ends up kind of impairing that whole signaling pathway. Another thing we have to pay attention to with insulin resistance is, once again, if a cell is used to running on glucose and now it's not getting the glucose that it normally gets, it's not getting the normal effect of insulin because insulin levels are all over the place and all out of whack because insulin resistance is high, well, then what ends up happening is the mitochondria itself, the energy powerhouse within the cell, becomes somewhat dysfunctional. When that happens, you have an inefficient vehicle, and I've talked about this using the same reference before, but think about a car that is squeaky clean, just got off the lot, okay? It passes its smog test, emissions, no big deal at all. Okay, that car becomes 20 years old and it's all beat up and maybe it's got two cylinders that are shot, well, you can bet your bottom dollar it's not going to pass smog, right? It's going to be producing a bunch of emissions. That's because it's inefficient. The mitochondria can happen, that can happen to the mitochondria too. So basically, the mitochondria become inefficient, and even though they're still scraping by and barely functioning, they're still on the road, and they're still doing their job, they're emitting a bunch of exhaust, and that exhaust is, once again, reactive oxygen species. So it's this vicious circle that therefore ends up causing more apoptosis. So you can see how the issue arises as a potential result of insulin resistance, okay? So it's not about just not eating that cookie today. If you're gonna have a cookie, have a cookie now and then. It's about not eating those six cookies three times a day, every day, for your entire life. And truly being able to make those incremental changes in your life. And eventually, if you really want to adopt a lower carb lifestyle, commit to it and go all the way. Anyhow, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.